right. Hi, everybody. Good morning. So mornings are not my favorite. I am notoriously bad at mornings. And anybody who has seen me at a conference can vouch for the fact that I never am up at 8 o'clock in the morning to be at a session. <laughs> so it's no surprise when a couple winters ago I wake up on a Monday morning and I'm feeling sick. My throat hurts. My head is stuffy. My whole body aches. I'm exhausted. And when this happened, I just chalked it up to the fact that I'd been traveling all weekend. There had been a lot going on, and I was just a little bit tired. And we're always busy at work, right? It's getting toward the holidays. Things are wrapping up, and so I needed to be into the office. So I went into work and was completely miserable, didn't feel any better throughout the day. Next day, I woke up feeling worse, and I was running a fever. So I text my boss and tell him, hey, I'm not going to come into work. I'm going to stay home sick. My so-called sick day turned into me laying on the couch wrapped in a blanket with my laptop, answering emails and text messages and tweets and trying to get things done for a big project we were staffing. And throughout that entire month of December, I went through this cycle where I would go into the office even though I didn't feel well because I had some important meeting or project that I felt like I just had to be there for. And then I would try to take a day off or try to take a weekend off and not allow myself to rest. And this all resulted to me going into the CodeMash conference in January, scheduled to teach a four-hour workshop. And I went into the conference on a heavy dose of steroids and antibiotics and just hoping I would be able to keep my voice in, a, in order to teach the workshop. The other thing that happened that same December is that I'm from Columbus, Ohio, and we have a big holiday party every year where all of the people from all of the meetups get together. And I remember going to this party that I had helped organize. And the thing that sticks out about me, about this party to me, isn't the fact that everybody had a great time, or we had this live band, or really good conversations. What stuck out to me is that a good half dozen or more people I talked to at that party were complaining about how tired they were, how their throat hurt, how their head hurt. But we all were showing up to this party because we felt like we had to be there, we had to be seen in the community. And I know that, in retrospect, if I'd rested that month, if I'd taken care of myself, I would have actually done a better job. I know I worked at half capacity that month. I know that I dropped balls. And I know that this wasn't the right thing to do. So I think about health a lot. I've supported people through many health issues, from family members with mental health issues to friends who have had a brain tumor. And going to that party, seeing all of those people be sick, made me vow to take better care of myself. And I started to want to bring health conversations out into the open and make it okay for all of us to discuss our health. So January rolls around and what happens in January? New Year's resolutions. <laughs> so going to January, all right, I'm going to get through this conference and then I'm going to get back on track with taking care of myself, resting and prioritizing my own health. Well, easier said than done. So one day I'm sitting there at my desk, chugging my coffee on a cold, gray, rainy January day, and I have these nonstop texts and phone calls. My Outlook badge is lighting up. My texts are coming through. People are popping into my desk. Cassandra, we need this. Cassandra, we need that. And I could not get a thing done. I was feeling stressed. I was feeling overwhelmed. And I had the following exchange with a friend. Um, they'd said that their day was crazy and disorganized, but not stressful. And I said, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to be a hermit. I'm in a rare moment of people exhausting me, and if I was a hermit, nobody would need anything from me. No support, no paperwork, no information, and no emotional tasks. Now, those of you who know me know that I'm an extrovert. I love people. I thrive on our energy. <laughs> I hear the laughs. Um, and so this day, I was so fed up and so sick and so tired that I no longer wanted to do the thing that I most like to do be around people and help them. So what happened to get me to this state? Very sedentary lifestyle, lots of hours behind my laptop at work, lots of hours in the evening trying to put together a workshop and a talk. I had so many demands on my time between conference planning, between the workshop, between some other events, and then just between trying to maintain my social life and keep up my house. Work was in this super high stress environment because it was a consulting company. And everything was on fire. So we're trying to staff up for a project. I'm supporting a couple coworkers, And just had a lot of different things going on. 
And as a result, my diet was a lot of user group pizza, happy hours, all that good stuff. So does this look familiar? This has kind of become our normal, right? This should not be our normal. We should not sacrifice our health, our happiness, and our well-being for the sake of money or technology or success. But we do. We do this all the time. But I'm a believer that if we as technical professionals don't talk about our health issues and don't take the time to have these discussions and take care of ourselves, we're going to continue to be an unhealthy industry. Recently, there's been a lot of discussion around burnout and that sort of situation that I just showed you, that's what leads to burnout. So here we're going to pause, give you the standard disclaimer, I am not a doctor. I am a law school dropout. I'm going to be speaking from my own experiences. I do have the fun triple diagnosis of ADHD, depression, and anxiety. And like everybody else, have other health issues and things that I struggle with. So I'll be drawing on my own experiences here. Now at a high level, when we don't take care of ourselves, it affects us in a number of ways. Physically, we suffer things like weight gain, immunity gets lower, aches and pains, and we miss work or underperform at work. Mentally, our unhealthy habit habits leave us hopeless, stressed, we shut down, sometimes we turn to destructive acts. And even more scarily, if we aren't taking care of ourselves physically, we take the risk of what's called chronic illnesses. According to the U.S. Center for Disease Control, or U.S. Center for uh, National Health Statistics, a chronic disease is one that lasts for more than three months, and it includes things like cancer, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. 70% of deaths are due to chronic diseases. 86% of our U.S. national health care costs are due to chronic disease. And the one that really struck me is that chronic diseases are some of the most preventable if we're making the correct lifestyle choices. Aside from that, neglecting your health doesn't only make you sicker and cost you a lot of money in medicine and doctor's visits, it actually affects your, your performance at work. You have lower productivity. I know full well that that month when I was sick, when I wasn't feeling well, I wasn't getting as much stuff done as I needed to get done. Morale was lower. And we all know that when we're working around somebody whose morale is low, whose mood is low, that can impact the rest of the team. And if you're not being as productive and you're not as pleasant to work around, that's going to impact your professional growth. So how do we go about improving our physical health? I'm going to focus on three key areas. The big thing to remember here is that you need to know what's important for your body. So you do need to be focusing on food, exercise, and sleep. And consistently making an effort to eat better food, be more active, and get more sleep is the best thing we can do about our health. Now, the cool thing is this doesn't have to be some big grand gesture. You don't have to get out there and go gluten-free vegan and try to run a marathon tomorrow. You can make small, consistent daily decisions and daily actions and be gentle with yourself along the way. So when it comes to food, one of my favorite quotes is Michael Pollan, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. One of my pet peeves, and marketers are particularly guilty of this, is when food is labeled as good or evil. You talk about this guilt-free chocolate cake and this sinful brownie. Food doesn't have morality. Food is delicious. It's something for us to be enjoyed with other people. The problem is if we run around eating too many of the wrong things. At one point, I worked in an office where we hosted a lot of user groups and training classes, and we had a snack and drink selection that rivaled most convenience stores. <laughs> we also hosted a lot of user groups and meetups, and so there was constantly pizza and all this stuff in the office. And I have a job that requires a lot of happy hours and social activities. So if I'm not careful, my lunch can look a lot like pizza and a Coke Zero, followed by vodka and chicken wings for dinner. And that's okay every once in a while, but not all the time. So what are the tips for eating more healthily at work and making it easier and more convenient? Knowing your dietary requirements is one thing. It's one thing that helps a lot is weekend food prep, preparing food ahead of time and having things that are quick and easy and convenient. For me, I know I don't have the discipline to food prep, but I've done things like meal kits or buying components that are pre-prepared that I can cook, put together food more quickly. Balancing the food you eat at mealtimes. This was a lesson that I relearned this summer after going to a conference where pretty much every meal consisted of meat and carbs. And by day three of the conference, my body was like, 
Cassandra, eat a vegetable. And so I implemented the guideline that for at least one meal at a conference, I need to eat a bunch of vegetables or produce because I know that's how I feel best. And eat lunch away from your desk. The reason I threw a D6 up here is because when I worked in an office, we would have board game lunch a few times a week. And we would get together, we would get away from our desks, and we would play a game. Now that I work from home, this looks a lot like meeting friends for lunch. But doing social and getting away from your desk will take you and make you feel more refreshed for the afternoon. Exercise. Does running late count as exercise? <laughs> if it did, I would be in the best shape ever. <laughs> so here's how exercise works in Cassandra's world. I go to sleep with these great plans to wake up at 6 a.m. and work out because I am not a morning person, so that makes sense. And the following morning goes one of two ways. I hit snooze, I hit snooze, I hit snooze. I sleep until the last possible minute, and I get up, and I'm frantically running around so I can log in for my first meeting of the morning. And the whole day, I'm just stressed and frazzled. Or I wake up, I exercise, I hate myself for that first 10 minutes and think it's really stupid that I'm out of bed so early. But then the music starts to kick in, and the endorphins start to kick in, and I keep the music on for the rest of the morning and just start my day on a lot more positive note. That's really hard to remember when the alarm goes off, though. Throughout the workday, even if I don't get a workout in, doing new scheduling, laziness, not feeling well, I try to do some other little things. Taking the stairs. We are on a boat with a gazillion stairs, and my roommate and I were joking about how we're going to be in great shape after this conference because we're walking up and down 10 flights of stairs. Stand up. Stretch. Especially if you work from home, it can be hard, or it can be easy to just get in that mode where you don't leave your desk. So schedule stretch breaks. Stand up. Walk around the block. For me, I take time in the afternoon and I go walk my dog. And treat your workouts like any other meeting. Put them on your calendar and keep them as an appointment because ultimately that's an appointment that you've made for yourself. And then sleeping. Want to be a morning person? There's an app for that. It's called an alarm, and it's the worst. <laughs> Absolutely agree. So in tech, we like to brag about how little sleep we get. We read these articles about these co-founders who only sleep five hours a night, every single night, who work 80, 90, 100 hours a week. And this is glorified. And a lot of times, sleep is the first thing that we sacrifice when we feel pressured to get everything done. We figure we can drink some coffee or an energy drink, and it'll be fine. And that can work for a day or two, but biologically, our bodies do require sleep. And this isn't just me saying this because I don't like to get out of bed. I, when we sleep, we have improved brain function. Our brain actually processes some of the information we pick up through the day while we're sleeping. This is why sometimes you'll go to sleep with a problem on your mind and wake up in the morning with a solution. Our bodies physically heal. They rebuild certain blood vessels when we are sleeping. Sleeping helps balance hormones, particularly the ones that control hunger and blood sugar. And we're more productive and we're safer when we're sleeping. And sleep deprivation leads to a higher incidence of things like diabetes, obesity, you know those chronic diseases that I was talking about earlier? Some of those are linked to sleep deprivation. So how do you get better sleep? Conventional wisdom is that you set a schedule, go to bed and wake up at the same time every night. For a lot of people, that's not realistic, that's not practical. I think the key is to know how much sleep your body requires and give yourself permission to sleep and to rest as you need to. Sleep hygiene. No bright lights before bed. When I'm home and on top of this, I shut off my, kit, my phone, my TV, Anything that's a lit up screen goes off at least an hour before bed because the spectrum of light our devices emit makes us want to be awake. And limit coffee, alcohol, and caffeine late in the day. For me, this is something that I prioritize. I know that I need roughly six to seven hours of sleep a night. I know that I can do a day or two of inadequate sleep. And I also know that my extroversion means that I'll get back to my hotel room at a conference and I'll be wound up for another hour, hour and a half. And so I literally set myself a curfew so that I can make sure I'm wound down enough to get some sleep. A lot of times I'll use that time to journal or read on my Kindle or do some unplugged activity. So by taking the time to improve our diet, our exercise, and our sleep, we fix some of these career-related problems. We're more productive. We're more, we're more well-rested. 
we're more nourished, so we get more production. We're in a better mood, we're happier, we're more pleasant to be around, and as a result, our professional growth is improved. But taking care of physical health isn't enough. There's an additional aspect to our health that's often ignored, whispered about, and that's our mental health. And the thing is that physical and mental health affect each other more than people sometimes like to acknowledge. Physical health issues can increase the risk of relationship and emotional problems. They can exacerbate things like depression and anxiety. Mental health problems can increase the risk of physical and relationship problems. And mental health problems affect our human behavior and our interactions. The example that comes to mind with this is stress. So when we think about stress, we think about it as this mood thing. Our body, our, we get really stressed out, we're worried, we're freaking out, and our brains are doing all of these things to try to make us be more productive. And so you think of it as a feeling, but stress also has a physical impact where your blood pressure is raised, your mood can change, and so it affects yourself physically as well as mentally. And it's interesting that something that's viewed as a mood thing or a mind thing actually has this physical impact. Nearly one in five American adults has a mental illness. And this is according to multiple studies through multiple international health organizations. Like I said earlier, I myself was diagnosed with ADHD in my mid-20s. A few years ago, depression and anxiety diagnoses came along, and I'll talk a little bit about that story. First, though, I want to talk about what a mental illness is. Mental illnesses affect how we think, behave, and feel. This interesting thing is that people with the same diagnosis can have drastically different experiences. So for some people, for instance, if they're in the midst of a depressive episode, they want to eat all the things in sight, whereas other people completely lose their appetite. And those are both perfectly valid ways that depression can manifest itself. The causes are genetics, biochemistry, life events and environment, and a lot of times it's a combination of things. It's not just a life event, it's not just biochemistry. A lot of times the combinations of factors cause these to manifest. All right, so in spite of mental illness, the important thing to know is that recovery is possible. If we take the time to get the right diagnosis, the treatment, and have the right support systems in place. But let's talk a little bit more about, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about ne how neglecting your mental health also impacts you as a team member you're less productive. So when I started to have issues where my depression was manifesting, I was having trouble getting out of bed. I was having trouble focusing. I was having trouble getting myself to work in the morning. And as a result, my productivity plummeted at work. Obviously, I wasn't in the best mood. I wasn't my usual happy, bubbly self to be around. And that started to impact a couple of my other team members as well, making me less pleasant to be around. And as a result, it can lower or hinder your professional growth. Fortunately, I caught things in time and started to get the treatment in kind that it didn't really affect my career, but I could see the path that I was headed on had I not taken care of myself mentally. So how do you diagnose a mental illness? It starts with recognizing whether you're ill and getting the proper treatment. Some of the signs and symptoms of mental illness are excessive worrying, especially if that worrying is paralyzing you from acting. Frequent mood swings. Trouble doing work, trouble focusing, trouble getting day-to-day -day tasks done. Trouble communicating, maybe you're snapping at people, maybe you're not able to get your points across as clearly. Avoiding social situations, isolating yourself, hiding in your room. And unfortunately, oh, changes in biological habits as well. You might be eating or sleeping more or less. And finally, sometimes substance abuse. Now here's one of the tricky things about mental illness. A lot of these things that are warning signs are also part of day-to-day -day life. We all have days when our moods fluctuate. We all have days when we can't focus or can't communicate or something goes wrong with our biology. So this is why the trick is to talk to a professional, talk to a doctor, and figure out whether or not you have an actual disorder or it's just part of day-to-day -day life. For me, where this really happened was it got to a point where I'd always struggled with the winter. I'd always had trouble with the cold, gray, dreary days in Ohio. But it got to a point where I could no longer yoga myself out of the sadness. I couldn't distract myself out of the sadness. I couldn't go running and get rid of the sadness. It was just this constant sense of gloom 
that would hang over me. No matter what setting I was in, I could be with my favorite people in my favorite place and I would still feel this kind of underlying sense of despair. And that's when I realized that it was something other than just kind of the winter blues. So I started going through the process. I went and saw my doctor. We talked through a lot of my family history, some other options, and he gave me a diagnosis. I armed myself with knowledge about not only what depression was and what anxiety is, but also how to treat it. Medication. I was put on one medication. It was a, an antidepressant, and I had some really bad reactions to it. And then my doctor put me on a different one, and that wind, wound up working. And a lot of times that's best with combination therapy, where you learn to change your behaviors, your thoughts. And the thing to remember about this, and another hard thing about it, is that these aren't overnight solutions. So when I get a migraine, I take my prescription medicine, I sleep for a few hours, and I feel better. That's not how depression works. It takes four to six weeks on average for any of your psych meds to kick in, and it takes an average of six to eight therapy sessions to even start getting results. So part of this is making the commitment to yourself. And you need a support system. You need people around you who are willing to help you through this event. And if there are people who aren't able to help you through this, they may not be the right people to be in your life. Now what's interesting about this is I had an incident. I mentioned I was supporting a sick coworker when I was that, that December. And I had a coworker who was sick. He had had a recent depression diagnosis and was very open about the fact that he was wanting some support. Another coworker had broken her ankle. These two people went through the exact same process. They got treatment, they got diagnosis, they got treatment, they got medication, they did therapy, and everybody all the time asked the girl who broke her ankle how she was doing. But nobody asked the guy who was recovering from depression how he was doing. He was just kind of viewed as lazy and a slacker because he was missing the stand-up sometimes. And so it took a few of us to step in and learn what was going on and be empathetic toward him to help support him in this area as well. The reason we don't want to talk about this, the reason I think that a lot of people didn't want to discuss this is because there's this unfair stigma around mental illness. Why does this stigma exist? A lot of times it's invisible. You can look at me and I wear bright clothes and I'm optimistic and I'm social, and you would never in a million years guess I'm somebody with depression. You can't see it the way you can see somebody who's perhaps in a wheelchair or walks with a cane. There's a fear of the unknown, and I think this is something that we in software development especially have a hard time with, as well as the fact that discussing feelings is hard. Mental illness isn't logical. It isn't black and white, and there's no one right solution for everybody. So I had somebody who I was very close to, and they were a software engineer, and they could not wrap their head around the fact that this wasn't an easy treatment, that this wasn't something that I could just get over. I couldn't just smile and feel better. And eventually that person left my life, and it wound up being a very good thing for me because I realized in retrospect that I deserve to have people in my life who can, in fact, support me as I go through this. <laughs> but I get it. Because engineers, right? Everything's black and white. Everything's a logical problem that you can solve very quickly. And then there's bullying, similar problems. Fortunately, I haven't had to deal with a lot of this, but I know people who have. So how do we start overcoming this stigma? We arm ourselves with understanding, with knowledge, with education. And I am so refreshed to see more and more conferences that have topics on this subject and topics on the subject of burnout, and top topics on the subject of wellness. It opens a conversation. Talking. If you're comfortable with it, talk about your own mental illness. I talk about this stuff all the time because I feel like it shows that you can be successful, you can be happy, you can have a fulfilled life in spite of a mental illness. Listening. And this is really hard. And this goes back to some of the empathy that Christina was talking about this morning. And that you need to listen and try to understand what the other person needs without kind of looking down on them, without sympathizing, and without trying to solve the problem. Because telling somebody who's in the middle of a panic attack to stop worrying isn't going to work. And it doesn't help when you're in the middle of a depressive episode and somebody says, well, just smile. So you need to be listening. And I have in my world, I have friends who, several of us, when we're having a day where we struggle, 
what we'll do is we have the system in place where we'll message each other and we'll say, hey, are you looking for advice or just somebody to listen? And then if we need to go into problem solving mode, we can, but if they just need somebody to talk to, we're that ear. And finally, there can be some fear of losing your jobs, how this impacts your time in the workplace. It's important to understand the laws of your country when it comes to disabilities. Under Americans with Disabilities Act, depression, anxiety, several other things are covered disabilities. So educate yourselves on your rights and how to communicate those to your employer if necessary. And that helps eliminate some of that fear that a mental illness will impact our jobs. It's important to have your medical and your legal and your human resources, but there are also some other resources that I think you should know about. There's NAMI, that's the National Alliance on Mental Illness, grassroots organization based here out of the US, and they focus a lot on removing some of the stigma and raising awareness around mental illness and treatment. Mentalhealth.gov, Mental Health Commission of Canada, whatever your home country's mental health commission is, these websites are a surprisingly great resource when it comes to high-level overviews of what different illnesses look like, links to crisis hotlines, advice for getting the help you need. So those can be a good starting point. And then is anybody familiar with OSME, Open Sourcing Mental Illness? Okay, really cool organization. A web developer named Ed Finkler started talking about his experiences with depression in the developer community and found out that there were a lot of other people who also struggled with these things. According to an OSME survey, 35% of people in the dev community have a mental illness compared to the 20% of the general population. And so they actually put out blogs, podcasts, and they have books for employers, employees, managers on how to discuss mental illness, your rights, and your treatment in the workplace. So definitely check those, weaknesses, or those resources out. So by taking the time to diagnose, understand, and treat our mental illnesses, we can help fix some of those career-related problems. We're increased productivity and morale. Since I got treated, since I started on my path to recovery, I get a lot more things done. I've achieved a lot more success. I feel more positive about the world, and I know it's impacting other people. And as a result, my professional growth has expanded. I've seen a lot more opportunities come along. I've been able to change careers from recruiting into community management, and have experienced a lot of other smaller successes along the way. And regardless of whether we struggle with physical or mental illness or both, there are things we can do in our daily lives to help ourselves be happier and healthier overall. So we're going to talk a little bit about self-care, fun, and our family and friends. Self-care is very hard to define without using the term self or care. <laughs> Basically, it's nurturing you give yourself. And there are two types. There's kind self-care, and these are the stereotypical things you think of, like taking a bubble bath, getting your nails done, playing video games, whatever it is that you need. I put a bunch of flowers up here because one thing I do is I, every time I go to the grocery store, I'll buy a colorful bunch of flowers, I'll put it on my kitchen table, and then every time I walk by my table, there's a little something beautiful that makes me smile. And to me, that's an important component of self-care. Journaling is the other one. When I started journaling, I used this little book called A Diary for Good and Bad Days. And it was this cool little diary because it would give you these prompts. And you would say, one page would be the bad things that happened that day, one would be the good. And so it only took like five minutes. And I liked how it ended with the more positive, you know, the good things that had happened in the day. Saying no is part of self-care. And this is something, thank you, I hear the applause, and this is something that I can sometimes struggle with because I want to do all of the things. But it's important to say no sometimes. So, for instance, last night I was asked to come out and hang out with some friends, and I said, no, I have a talk in the morning, I need to get some sleep, self-care. And I said, the rest of the week I can have fun, it's fine. <laughs> and scheduling time to yourself on your calendar, whether this is scheduling your workouts, whether this is you're excited about a new video game that came out and you're scheduling time to play it, Whatever it is that you do, schedule that time for yourself. Having fun. As adults, we sometimes forget how important this is, but fun is the thing that brings joy to life. It's the reason that we're here. It's the reason we all work so hard, and so I think it's important to do that. And fun activities tie into our support systems more than we sometimes might realize. So for me, I have a soccer ball and a D6 up here because 
Soccer and board games are kind of my two main areas of my social life. Over time, I found a group of people who are into both technology and my local soccer team, the Columbus Crew. And some of the friendships I've made out of that group, out of that tailgate group, are some of the friends who got me through a lot of my hard times. We always get each other through rough times. Take your vacation time. In this room, I think everybody probably likes to travel. I know a lot of people don't. So take your vacation time and stay at home and work in your garden and do your woodworking project and just take time to relax. Americans especially are notorious for not taking our vacation time, but we need to rest and be refreshed. And finally, find ways to laugh. Find things to laugh at. Find ways to bring little bits of joy into every day. And your relationships matter. Friends are important. Accountability is important. So my year of 2018 was a dumpster fire. <laughs> In order, I fractured my ribs, my husband left, I was rear-ended, my dog died, and I lost my job. It was, it was a country song, is what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, I don't, the only way I was able to get through that year, and in the midst of all this, I'm going through trying to get my depression under control. That was fun. So in the midst of all of this, the only thing that got me through it is some of those friends from the tailgate and some of these people in the community. Our friends, our family, our support systems are what get us through. They help us with goal setting and accountability, any number of things that you're trying to change in your life, and my friends helped me a lot with that. They give you support in tough times, and I had a tough year, a couple years there, and it was great to know that there were people there who were supporting me and watching out for me, and when they needed somebody to be there for them, I could be there for them. And more recently, there's been a lot of celebration. Somebody from my friend circle got engaged. I got a job I'd been trying to find for years. All of these different things happen, and those same friends who supported each other through hard times are now celebrating our successes together. So in talking about our health, we, more, we need more transparency, and we need more empathy. And the more we make it OK to discuss and prioritize caring for our health, the more normal it becomes, the more standard it becomes. And it opens these conversations and prevents some of that burnout that we're starting to face. And the important thing to remember during the health conversations is that it's more about listening and understanding than it is about giving advice and solving problems. The other important thing is that our physical and mental health not only affect us, and they not only affect our coworkers and our team and our work, but they also affect our families. So we need to be taking care of ourselves if we're able to take care of other people. So don't be afraid to take care of your health. Don't be afraid to help others do the same. I think the end result's gonna be a happier, healthier, and more productive developer community. <laughs>